Good evening and welcome to the San Bernardino City Council meeting of March the 24th, 220. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Can we have roll call, please? Council Member Davis? Here. Council Member Mason? Here. Council Member Medina? Here. Vice Mayor Salazar? Here. Mayor Medina? Here. If we'd ask our Public Works Director, Jimmy Tan, to lead us in the pledge this evening. Public comments on items not on the agenda. Is there anything that's come through? Uh, looking to staff, there has been nothing that has been submitted to the clerk's office or via the website. And there's no public here honoring and respecting the stay at home. So we appreciate that. Um, let's move on to announcements and presentations. First item, receive COVID-19 update. City Manager. Good afternoon uh, to the mayor, members of the city council, uh, and the public uh, watching at home. Uh, my name is Javon Grogan, and I'm the city manager, and I would like to give the council and the community a update on uh, the city's response to COVID-19. So we have a PowerPoint uh, in the slide that is up, talks about our agenda. Uh, we'll begin with a brief update on COVID-19. We'll talk about the shelter-in-place order. Uh, and then we will talk about the actions that the city has taken, uh, a number of the service reductions that we uh, put in place. Uh, we'll talk about our community outreach and notification efforts, and then we'll talk uh, a lot about volunteer uh, efforts. Uh, and then we will, we will be here for questions from the city council. And so let me begin by giving a little bit of the recap that I gave uh, at our last meeting on uh, March 20th uh, on Friday. Uh, just last Friday when the city council approved a um, emergency proclamation. So I think as we all know, the outbreak uh, began in Wuhan, China in late 2019. Uh, and we are past the outbreak stage and are in a global pandemic stage. Uh, in San Mateo County, uh, there are, as of today, uh, 161 positive cases and one death. Uh, I'll point out uh, that when I was here on Friday, uh, there was only 100 cases in the county. So in the four-day period, uh, the number has increased by 61 positive confirmed cases. And that is uh, because we all know that the uh, availability of tests are increasing. There's a drive-through testing site here uh, in the county. Uh, and so as we test, we know that the number of confirmed cases will go up. Next, I want to talk a little bit about San Mateo County uh, and just say that uh, personally, I think the county uh, is doing an amazing job um, having sat in on their uh, weekly briefings and their, the coordination that they're providing to all the cities. I've worked in a number of counties, Alameda and Contra Costa County, and the level of collaboration and support uh, that we received here from the county is uh, really unparalleled in anything I've seen. Uh, so the county is doing a number of things. Uh, they are, uh, our coordination and our link to the California uh, Public Health Department and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention uh, the city council knows that there are uh, daily briefings of all the elected officials that occur uh, Monday through Friday, uh, and uh, our county actually helped petition the governor's office for a reprieve of the Brown Act so that all city council members uh, can participate on in that call. And so you're all getting up-to-date information on this global pandemic and our local response uh, directly from the county, which is uh, really great information. They're also facilitating uh, collaboration and coordination among uh, all of the cities in the county and the special districts. There's uh, daily calls on that. Uh, and um, we are, uh, one of the things that happened initially uh, is all the cities really wanted to be coordinated in their response uh, in the county, knowing that we're so uh, closely related. Uh, the county set up a drive-through COVID-19 testing um, uh, facility and that is at the San Mateo County Event Center in the city of San Mateo uh, to have access to that as a reminder to the community you, ha you still have to go through your primary care physician uh, you cannot just show up and be tested um, but there is one group that can show up and be tested and that was a new addition and that is our uh, law enforcement and our, our fire personnel because they have uh, a, a very close interaction with members of the public uh, that may very well 
uh, uh, have a COVID-19 issue, uh, the county did allow for public safety personnel uh, if they have a potential exposure to have rapid testing because we want to really isolate them so they do not uh, infect other members of the community. And so that uh, is now uh, active. Uh, the county has also set up a temporary housing, uh, what they're calling a T-HOP, Temporary Housing Options Plan uh, at the San Mateo County Event Center. What that is is that we know that there will be a number of people in our community that have a positive case of COVID-19 and need to quarantine uh, in a location other than their home. Uh, you may have a, um, a senior individual in your household uh, that uh, you may be extremely concerned about um, passing the virus to them and, and so the county knew that there would be a number of people in that uh, situation and set up a essentially temporary uh, remote quarantine site at the event center. Uh, the county uh, also just today passed a uh, countywide emergency moratorium on evictions for residential properties uh, that is specific to economic issues related to COVID-19 and so the Board of Supervisors adopted that just earlier today at their board meeting. The county is also providing countywide um, enhanced homeless services with the goal of providing uh, as much immediate housing as they can and is in the process of leasing not only hotel rooms but other facilities uh, to get uh, our homeless population off the street uh, in, in, in a place that um, uh, will help prevent the community spread that is occurring and that is another risk population. The next slide I want to provide uh, to council and the community uh, is the global COVID-19 confirmed cases. Uh, and so as I stand here today, there are a total of 417,000 confirmed cases uh, in the world. And if anyone doubts that there is rapid uh, increase in cases uh, globally, not just locally, uh, look at what the figure was just four days ago when I was here. Uh, it was 271,000 and now it's 417,000. Uh, and just a couple days before that is when we passed the 200,000 mark. Uh, the number of uh, global um, deaths increased by more than 7,000 uh, and a 20,000 20, um, person increase in the, the number of individual, individuals that have recovered. The next slide that I want to share, uh, I know the trend line is a little hard to see uh, but because we downloaded it from the John Hopkins website. But the basic data is there and, and you can really see just the exponential increase in the number of confirmed cases globally uh, from January 21st where there was less than 500 cases known in the world to over 417 uh, today, March 24th. And so on February 1st there were 20,000, uh, 95,000 on March 1 and now uh, because of the community spread and the ramp up in testing not just in the U.S. but across the world uh, over 400,000 confirmed cases of, of COVID-19, a, a true pandemic, uh, and uh, the issue of our time. Uh, next, uh, this slide is familiar uh, to a number of you because it, uh, we displayed it on Friday, but all of the measures that are being put in place, uh, our county measure, the state measure, uh, and all of the recommendations from our Center for Disease Control and Prevention are all lowered, are all geared toward uh, lowering the bell curve so that um, our healthcare system really has the capacity to deal with those that do get sick and need medical intervention uh, from COVID-19. And so the statistic that I shared prior is still true. Uh, approximately 80% of the confirmed cases we think will not need medical intervention. 20% will need medical intervention. And the mortality rate um, is approximately 3% and higher among more vulnerable populations. And so what we really want to do is sort of stop interacting for a little bit um, and lower that curve uh, so we can reduce uh, the spike in that bell curve and, and let our healthcare system have the ability to address that 20% that we, we know uh, will li more than likely need medical intervention. Uh, and so the county order, uh, I will recap that really quickly, but uh, as you guys all know, on March 16th, there was a six county order in the Bay Area that was issued uh, limiting daily activities such as travel, gatherings, business functions to only those that are essential uh, and it allowed uh, governments like us to define what our essential services are uh, and scale back our, our organizations and we did that and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, four days later, as we all know, Governor Schwarzenegger 
uh, applied that order uh, statewide. Slightly different, um, uh, but the, the net impact is the same, uh, which is a, a shelter in place order statewide. Uh, the county order uh, that is in effect um, and a, a, a little bit more stringent than the statewide order uh, and uh, all of the uh, lawyers sort of did a quick conference and conferred that uh, uh, when there is a local order that is more strict, the local order takes precedent and so we are still under the San Mateo County order uh, because it is slightly more strict. Uh, and so those businesses that can remain open are food providers, homeless shelters and wraparound services, pharmacies. Uh, child care facilities, gas stations, banks, laundry facilities, uh, health care, law enforcement, and essential government functions can remain open. Essentially anything else, um, the recommendation is that you be at home. Um, there are a few caveats to that, uh, I should say, uh, and a number, uh, there's sort of been a flurry of confirmations uh, with businesses saying, can I stay open, can I stay open, uh, and there's a resource for that, uh, and that is the uh, San Mateo County Legal Call Center. So the county set up a call center for businesses that have questions on uh, are they covered by the order. Uh, and there are a number of exceptions to that. One of them uh, is housing construction is allowed under the county to continue. And so a number of cities, uh, including ourselves, are continuing uh, to support the inspection of uh, housing projects that uh, are going up and are in the, in the middle of construction. <coughs> Um, and the county set up a frequently asked questions page and Sam CETA is a resource. It is the San Mateo County Economic Development Association and there are a number of business resources there uh, for the public. Any small business actually, uh, large and small, uh, and there are actually uh, now becoming uh, links and, and resources to small business loans that are not just available here in San Bruno but available countywide. Uh, so with the declaration of emergency, uh, the city took a number of immediate steps. Uh, the first thing we did is we activated our EOC. In the picture there is an uh, image of the city's EOC where we gather representatives uh, from all across the city uh, and have a org structure um, where we essentially do what we need to do to protect this community. Uh, and a number of steps were taken to define our essential services and um, uh, protect our, our personnel. And so. Uh, that emergency declaration was uh, signed on March 16th uh, and then ratified by the council uh, last Friday. And so our essential services here are public safety, police, fire, medical, our public utilities, uh, our city net cable services, uh, water and sewer. So all of those are continuing. Are continuing. Uh, and any emergency repair permits, and so not only are we supporting uh, at this time the continuation of housing construction. We are supporting if your water heater breaks or if you have an electrical issue and you have to come in for a permit, uh, we will absolutely support that and we know that that is essential for you uh, staying in your home uh, and staff is uh, available both remotely working from their house uh, and as needed in City Hall to support that. We did a number of service modifications. We uh, immediately closed all city counters uh, and encouraged the public to be served online or via phone uh, and we are available for essential appointments only uh, and like most other businesses uh, we have a skeleton crew um, uh, in-house uh, to support really our EOC and really essential police fire services uh, and then a few people in our um, finance department our building and our public works department for those essential appointments that really have to occur we know people will be walking in uh, 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 for, for things and uh, as uh, employing appropriate social distancing within our workforce, uh, we are continuing to allow that. Uh, one example is we are encouraging everyone to pay their utility bill online um, and utilize those resources, but sometimes people want to come drop that check off. You can drop that check off in the mail slot outside of City Hall and we regularly empty that throughout the day. And you can also pay um, uh, w w with cash. Uh, we are uh, discouraging that, but we know a number of people in our community uh, routinely pay their utility bill in cash, uh, and we have a limited availability for that, and we'll support that. Uh, public meetings, we canceled uh, or postponed all public meetings uh, initially, with the exception of city council meetings, because they are essential to governance and, 
ensuring uh, that the business uh, of the city is done. And so uh, that is an example of that is tonight where we have our audience set up with social distancing. As I turn around, there's not one member of the public here, uh, but we know that people are watching uh, on TV on Channel One and we were able to set up streaming video uh, today and so that is occurring as well. We are also in the process of researching uh, virtual community engagement platforms. Um, no one knows where we're headed just yet. Uh, we could really be in a new normal um, um, and, and be successful at lowering the bell curve, um, or we uh, can enter a period where uh, there are potentially more restrictions on mobility. Uh, but one of the things we know, uh, likely no matter what, where we're headed, the need for virtual community engagement uh, will, uh, has increased, will increase, and we have a number of topics that uh, will be before the city council over the next few months, and we are looking into uh, more virtual community engagement platforms for that to occur, so more on that later. The next thing that I want to say that we set up uh, and really um, created from a basis of our emergency operations plans, but frankly, it's been a little over 100 years since the last pandemic, um, and so tuning up those plans to deal with uh, the issue that we have at hand was, was a significant lift over the last two weeks. And so we developed uh, specific COVID-19 response levels for the city of San Bruno, uh, a level one, which is a watch level, which uh, we were at um, uh, approximately a week, and a, half, a week and a half ago, which is essentially practice safety precautions uh, and only minor changes to operations. Um, and that's really when we had only advisory notices from the county health officer. Alert level two is practice enhanced precautions and a moderate change um, in operations. And we have uh, a, a list of the services and how they will be, be provided if we were at level two. Unfortunately, we did not hit a level two and we uh, immediately went to a level three uh, when we had uh, the uh, all six health, uh, county health officers in the Bay Area on March 16th put in um, the shelter in place orders. And so we are currently at a warning level three stringent precautions in place um, and really only providing essential services. Uh, and so as a part of our uh, con uh, continuity of operations plans, uh, these three levels uh, make up um, how we will moderate city services. And one of the things we know um, is that as we uh, get through this period and come out of this, we will likely over the next six months to potentially 12 months float in between these various levels. Um, and so uh, the public shouldn't expect that we uh, will go from a warning level one, uh, a warning level three, and then we will be uh, done with uh, COVID-19 until there's really a vaccine and that vaccine is widely available in the US. We will likely be flirting, uh, floating in between uh, these levels as we moderate our, our services to the community uh, and um, take safety precautions. So we took a number of actions. Uh, uh, we as an entity, um, uh, like um, most other businesses, had to immediately uh, accelerate telecommuting. Uh, and in municipal services, uh, you actually don't have a lot of telecommuting uh, like you do uh, in other businesses. And so it was quite a big lift internally um, to set up telecommuting and um, the need to have some of our employee employees answer city phones uh, in their home. Um, to comply with the order uh, was, a, was a number of lift and sort of all of our IT challenges I won't talk about, but like every other business, uh, we, we have those in this new environment where everyone is trying to uh, telecommute and do it in, in, in less than a week. Um, but we did waive a number of fees and extend a number of timelines. We waived uh, late library fees, uh, all city net services. Uh, we are temp temporarily uh, um, uh, not doing service disconnects for non-payment. Uh, we are continuing to sweep the streets, but we uh, are, are not issuing parking tickets. Um, we are extending uh, permit deadlines uh, due to, to the unique environment uh, and waiving uh, late fees for ut utility payments. Uh, one of the things that we were also able to do, uh, and I, I really want to congratulate the fire department in taking um, very, very swift action, uh, frankly, before a lot of the other cities in the county did it, and we were able to secure uh, reusable particulate filter mass for all of our public safety personnel. And so um, it's a, a higher level mass uh, that is a, a what's called a P100, but it's a two part uh, particulate mass that we were able to uh, order. We found a supplier. Uh, 
we were able to get them and, and get all of our public safety personnel um, 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 fit tested and uh, certified to wear those. Uh, and those are, are, are good for 18 months. And so um, thank you. Uh, and you should know that your city has been extremely resourceful. Um, uh, there are supply chain disruptions occurring uh, already, and we have employees um, um, driving two hours away to stock up on gloves uh, when they were available, not in the Bay Area, but um, uh, you could drive uh, two, two to three hours away and get them. Uh, we did that, and so we have a stock of uh, some PPE in-house. Um, and just today we had an employee um, drive to pick up uh, 15 gallons of isopropyl alcohol so we can make our own disinfectant uh, because we're, we're actually running out um, of what we have in stock and our supplier uh, is unable to provide it uh, like, like everyone else is dealing with. And so uh, we're becoming resourceful as of all businesses and, uh, and individuals in this time. Um, canceling events. Uh, so unfortunately, we have had to cancel all regular and pre-scheduled city programs and classes and those are canceled until further notice. Uh, and so that's everything at our, our library events, um, our recreation programs and leagues, our after school programs, our fitness classes, our spring camp. Importantly, we have not made a decision, and I think it's important for the public to know this, we have not yet made a decision that we will cancel summer camp. Um, and that is a TBD to be determined, but we are canceling spring camp uh, that was set to launch on April 6th and go from April 10th. Uh, senior programs are, tip, are, are temporarily suspended, albeit our lunch program, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And a few citywide special events, our Easter egg hunt on April 4th, and uh, Social Connections, which is a, a wonderful program uh, for the disabled community, unfortunately, uh, has been postponed. Um, and so uh, we, we have been forced to uh, cancel and postpone a number of uh, well-loved community programs. Our, our senior program, so we have uh, canceled all regular senior programs that occur here in this facility, uh, and those are suspended until further notice. Uh, the council will remember that our senior lunch program is, is well utilized by our community, and on a regular day we serve anywhere from 100 to 150 people Monday through Friday. Uh, we have had to stop that program in its uh, normal capacity, uh, but we were able to, uh, because of a lot of local connections, identify those uh, in our local senior community that um, uh, are, at, are most vulnerable and really relied on that uh, daily Monday through Friday lunch program as their primary meal. And so we do have staff delivering a limited number of meals. Uh, and so they're still cooked here um, and uh, they're, delivered in, they're, they're delivered out to the senior community uh, via that. And so there, there is a number uh, that our seniors can call if they are uh, really in need of a uh, senior lunch and that is area code 650. 616-7150. Uh, all of our playgrounds and, and public restrooms are unfortunately closed now, and so uh, we are putting that out on social media and, and uh, in various platforms. Uh, but similar to a lot of the cities in the county, uh, we have closed uh, the playgrounds to, due to COVID-19 uh, and closed public restrooms, unfortunately, uh, due to the lack of need um, uh, or the lack of the ability to acquire uh, cleaning supplies. We're really at a point now where we are starting to uh, ration um, and uh, become very um, uh, diligent in how we use the cleaning supplies that we have on hand. Um, and so uh, we have decided to close public restrooms in large part for that matter. Um, parks and open space, uh, an important thing. So the community should know while the playground structure is closed, uh, at this moment, uh, city parks and our open space remain accessible. Uh, however, we are asking everyone to stay six feet apart when you use those. If you go out walking with individuals in your household, you can be within six feet of them. Uh, but they, we all really need to comply with the health department's order, um, with the health officer's order, uh, and stay six feet away. And uh, we know that people are cooped up in their house and, and really want to get out. Uh, but our parks and open space are not an area to, to congregate. And so um, similar to what I think um, was reported yesterday uh, in the press is that over the weekend, uh, a lot of people, uh, not only in the Bay Area, but throughout the state, um, 
were cooped up in their house, so they decided to go to a state park. Uh, and then the governor said, you know what, we really can't have that, so we're clo closing all state parks and beaches and, and parking lots. And so we have not yet taken that step locally, uh, but uh, if in fact our parks become a gathering place, uh, we may very well have to take that step. And so if you're using our park, uh, please maintain the appropriate uh, social distance of, uh, of, uh, from the other users. Uh, as the council and I think the community knows, we developed a whole host of um, community outreach mechanisms and I really have to congratulate our PIO team in the EOC for an amazing job that they've done. And so there's a website, our regular city um, web address slash coronavirus, uh, and there's a whole host of information on there, uh, FAQs, uh, links to CDC, health department resources. Uh, we are pushing out information on Nextdoor, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, we have uh, taken over Channel 1 and canceled all programming. And Channel 1, I, I want the community to know that if you have a question, go to Channel 1, watch it for about 15 minutes, and uh, hopefully your question will be answered or you will be pushed uh, or directed to the right resource, whether that's the county, the CDC. Uh, and so uh, we really um, leverage that public uh, access channel uh, to, uh, as a primary resource to providing the public with information. Uh, San Mateo County Alert System, uh, we've uh, utilized that and we are asking uh, the community to sign up for those. And we've issued press releases as, as we know. Uh, so another thing on community outreach, uh, one of the things that is happening today, today is the Great American Takeout. Uh, and so support your local business uh, during this COVID-19 crisis. And so today, if you have not uh, made dinner at home, why don't you think about getting it from uh, takeout at one of our wonderful local restaurants. And so um, the Great American Takeout is today, March 24th. Uh, all grocery stores uh, are open, as in, as is a number of restaurants, pharmacies, and child care centers. Uh, we all know the gyms, bars, and entertainment. Uh, and any non-essential business is closed. Uh, at our last council meeting, we talked a, a lot about um, getting a list of businesses that are still open, even though it's changing um, rapidly. The Chamber of Commerce did step up and develop a list of businesses, uh, restaurants that are open in their hours of operation. And so they have developed a uh, document uh, that is literally in the process of, of, of being refined. And so when I checked just before this meeting, it was not on their website, but it is being pushed out um, uh, on social media and a number of different platforms. And so I know Council Member Mason, it is on their, it is on their website now. They post there. So they posted it on Facebook, uh, not yet made it on their website. Uh, but we have a lot of people in the community that stepped up, and I know that there was a host of volunteers that got together and literally called every restaurant to make that list available. And so uh, we'll, we'll be sure to push that out. Volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. So uh, this is Sam Bruno, and when, and when something happens, uh, Sam Brunens like to really respond and, and step up uh, to help out. Um, and I, I think we've all been challenged um, um, in this pandemic, uh, and one of the ways the community has been challenged is that normal way of sort of saying I'm there for my neighbor, we all can't do because we're following the health officer's orders. Uh, and so uh, in a few slides, I want to um, let the council and the community know of a number of volunteer avenues, both locally to, uh, in San Bruno, regionally at the county level and statewide. But before I tell you about those, I want everyone to wait. And before you sign up to volunteer, you really need to do your part. And so this is my public service announcement too. Before you raise your hand and volunteer, make sure you're doing everything you can do to stop the spread of COVID-19. Um, and while you um, may feel that you're healthy, in fact, you may have the virus and be asymptomatic uh, and infect someone else. And so we really should be following those CDC guidelines of uh, washing our hands, um, cleaning all surfaces, staying home when we feel ill, uh, not touching your hands, nose, or face, um, and when you have to cough or sneeze, do it in your uh, your elbow. It's it, it's sometimes hard to remember, and if I think about what I just did 10 minutes ago when I was at this podium, I think I touched my face, and so um, uh, we all have to do our, do our part uh, and, and remember that, uh, frankly, we're in a new time, and we're in a time where we have to be very cognizant of not only our own safety, but the safety of our fellow neighbor. And so, but if we want to help out our fellow neighbor and we're doing everything we can, uh, what do we do? Uh, and so uh, 
the San Bruno Community Foundation, uh, with the support of Leslie Hadamia, the executive director, has built a website uh, that is San Bruno specific, uh, that has a host of volunteer uh, ideas where you can volunteer, you can donate, uh, you can sign up uh, to uh, work at a food bank. And, and so there's a host of information on that website. And we have a new email address that's community at sbcf.org. Uh, and the website is up there. It's um, the San Bruno Community Foundation's website. And again, all these are sort of easy to find. I know websites are long, but if you just Google San Bruno Community Foundation, go right to their main homepage, you'll find it. Um, a wonderful website. Uh, so at the county, um, what are the volunteer opportunities at the county? So uh, the San Mateo County has actually um, uh, completely uh, modified their homepage. So the homepage of the County of San Mateo is now the, um, dedicated to COVID-19. So if you go to the county's homepage, uh, you will see right in the middle pane a volunteer section. And so the county has set up a, a survey where if you don't know how you uh, want to support, but you want your name out there, you can fill out uh, this form uh, on the county's website and have your name uh, be uh, put on a list and, and flag all of your unique skill sets. And so should there, should there be a need, they will call you. I think as of today, we heard that there are over a thousand people in the county that have signed up in just uh, the last few days since this has been up. Uh, the county is also requesting any donations of medical supplies, masks, gowns, or anything like that. So if you have them, uh, please go on the county website and donate. Uh, also, uh, the county uh, is looking for skilled medical workers. We know that um, uh, even at, at this point uh, that we are at now, that we are getting to the point where we are overwhelming our health care system. And so if you have any um, nursing or, or medical skills, uh, please think about volunteering for your community. Uh, and the county has set up um, a way for you to do that. And so there's a number of a uh, volunteer coordinator, uh, and that's up on the screen, but it's area code. 209-204-9160, uh, and you may be wondering why, that's, why is that a Central Valley Stockton area code? It's because it's somebody that may live out there but decided, you know what, I'm gonna, uh, I have connections to the county and I'm going to volunteer my time. And, and the county actually has a number of people that are supporting their county EOC working remotely and helping out uh, many hands, helping with this uh, unprecedented pandemic. Uh, also uh, approved today, um, Sam, San Mateo County Strong, uh, a new initiative approved by the county uh, and seeded with $3 million that was approved just today uh, by the County Board of Supervisors, and that's using Measure K funds. And the purpose is to address the swift and unexpected uh, impacts of COVID-19 and the, and the pandemic and the impacts that that has had at a really local level on some of the most um, vulnerable people in our society. And so individuals and families really helping to cover basic needs. Uh, small businesses, helping them avoid layoffs uh, and to stay open and remain uh, a, a feasible business. And we all know how um, sort of people were prepared uh, and had reserves, but frankly, no one was prepared um, for this level of impact that, that we're feeling now and the, and, um, the potential for it to go on. Uh, and nonprofits. Um, and so uh, there's a new website, smcstrong.org. Uh, and the county is asking for, if you have the ability to donate big or small, donate to this effort. Uh, and this will be um, led by the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. And again, the county um, um, funded it uh, today with initial seed money. And so they're looking for big, for donors, large and small, to help out with this effort. Uh, and then lastly, I want to talk about the state. Uh, there uh, is a state website um, where you can be a disaster health care worker. Uh, and, um, healthcarevolunteers.ca.gov, uh, sign up there uh, to have your name on a list to be uh, on the roster of people that are called not just for this disaster, but other disasters. And uh, the state will deploy you out uh, to help communities. And so uh, it, it's really a, a process uh, for people with medical uh, and healthcare skills. And so if you have those skills, uh, maybe you're retired and, and, and you wanna help out now or in the future, uh, please go to the state website and sign up. In addition, uh, the, uh, the state has also um, has a website that is serve.ca.gov. It's just at the bottom uh, of this screen. And it's for, uh, and they're essentially calling all healthy uh, Californians uh, to do things like deliver meals, uh, donate to a shelter or a food bank, uh, volunteer um, 
um, uh, uh, to provide hygiene kits, donate blood, uh, or support a local nonprofit. And, and so the state has really uh, created that resource. And so I know initially in the first sort of uh, days of this pandemic, everyone was saying, how can I help? How can I help? And there weren't a lot of resources out there. But now there's truly a wealth of uh, opportunities for people to uh, put their name on a list and even um, um, help out both locally, regionally, or statewide. Uh, lastly, I want to say if uh, you are in need of assistance um, from the city, uh, you can call our main line, which is 616-7058. Uh, um, uh, but uh, really, go to the website if you can, um, because the website will direct you to uh, a host of uh, um, services, and the website has the uh, direct line for all of our departments, uh, and so all of those uh, we have insured. Um, not only have a voicemail, but uh, most of the time if a customer is not being served, we really want a, a live body to pick up those department lines. Uh, this is the main line that will get you to a phone tree, uh, but if you go to the website, uh, you, you'll get uh, the number to the department uh, to get a live body. Uh, general questions about shelter, if you need shelter, food, basic assistance, any non-medical items, dial 211 from a cell phone or a regular phone. You'll be connected to a, uh, the county's 211 system that will push you to city resources or regional uh, resources, and there's a website there um, for uh, FAQs for um, the shelter-in-place order. And lastly, if you have a medical issue, uh, the guidance is still the same. Contact your primary care physician. That is really how you will get prioritized uh, for a COVID-19 test and get the uh, immediate assistance that you directly need. So that concludes my presentation tonight. I want to thank the City Council uh, for the time. I know it was a long presentation, uh, but we w really wanted to uh, give some thorough information to both uh, yourselves and the community. Thank you. Thank you, Javon. Any uh, questions or comments from my colleagues? Through the Chair. Marty. Yes. Um, I haven't been able to, uh, I've been pretty good at sheltering in place. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that. So I don't know if the gun store is still open on El Camino, has that been closed? Um, so uh, gun stores, uh, so Peninsula Guns uh, on El Camino, uh, when I looked yesterday, uh, they were closed. Um, uh, I do not know if Big Five uh, is closed at this point. Um, I think they're, so we're getting that question a lot. Uh, the county is getting that question a lot. Uh, are gun stores covered on, under the Health, the health officers order and are they essential uh, service? Uh, I really won't say any further because the honest answer is uh, you really need to be a lawyer um, uh, because there's some Second Amendment issues uh, uh, that are at play here with uh, the ability for uh, gun stores to, to close and um, um, and so I, I know that there are challenges countywide. Uh, getting gun stores to comply with the order. Um, and here, I do believe that uh, Peninsula Guns is closed, uh, but Big Five, uh, as of late, remains open. Thank you. To the chair. Laura. Uh, just one question. Are all the hours of operations, I know unlimited, is it still 8 to 5? So if you have a cable, uh, internet issue, you can call 8 to 5. If you have a question about your water utility bill, whatever it may be, it's all 8 to 5. Yes, that is still uh, in place right now. Thank you. Question? Anyone else? Yes. Linda. Um, so the other day I saw a post, um, it was on Nextdoor, from one of the Millbury City Council members uh, regarding um, flushing and that it's overflowing, I guess, some of those sewage systems. Uh, and I'm just, and I, there was an article on about Novato having the same issue, and I'm just curious to know if San Bruno is, has any concern um, around I guess clog, clogging. I don't know if that would be the the right term. But is, the, is the sewage still flowing in uh, the right direction? Uh, as of yet, yes, the sewage is flowing in the right direction. Um, uh, and uh, in my last check-in uh, with our uh, sewer utility department, uh, they reported everything status quo. Um, I do want to say that you know we are sort of in an unprecedented time where everyone is home using all the services, uh, and so. Uh, we will continue to be mindful of that. Thank you. The other question I had was around banks. Um, banks are an essential service, but I have received um, reports that I guess U.S. Bank has been closed in all their locations, at least in the peninsula. 
And so my question is, how do individuals um, get money out if their bank is closed? And how do you find out what your bank hours are if they are open at this time? Right. Uh, and so the best resource that we could say for that um, is all of the normal resources, wh where, whether it's looking up um, the phone number uh, or going online. Uh, I, I do think that we will continue to have businesses that are deemed essential by the county order that will de individually decide to close, right? Uh, sort of nationally, we have Starbucks making that decision. Even though uh, as a cafe they could stay open, uh, they have decided to clo close all of their locations that are not drive through locations. And so um, I, I think if this is prolonged, we will see more and more businesses making that individual decision. And then along the same lines, are there any specific um, resources that, I don't know if it would be a legal aid group, but I'm getting messages in particular from the Hispanic community um, asking, how do I know if I can work? Gardeners, house cleaners, um, living paycheck to paycheck, who can they contact to specifically say this particular area of work is essential or is not essential? Absolutely. So um, the best resource that I will say uh, is call 211. Uh, that is the um, best, um, sort of easiest way. Um, if you if you have a question, they will direct you. I will also go back to another slide uh, because there is a direct um, uh, legal hotline uh, from the, where businesses can call uh, that San Mateo County has put together to interpret the order. Uh, and so that is, uh, they're open from 8 to 4 p.m. Uh, that number is area code 650-363-4588. Um, um, and you can call if you're a business and you have a question on, you know, whether I, I should stay, order, uh, stay open, uh, you can uh, call that number. But what I would actually suggest is before you call that number, go to the website and check out the FAQs because as the county legal department answers the question, they're adding it to the FAQ. So when they get the question on, and that actually came up, mm -hmm. uh, are gardeners covered? Is that an essential service? The answer to that is, is no, they are not an essential service. Uh, and we are having, uh, I was outside of City Hall and uh, helped a resident just the other day who uh, came to City Hall wondering uh, if her husband, a gardener, could continue to work. Um, but we are getting that question. Uh, so the best resource is one, think call 211, you will be routed. Uh, if you uh, can go to the county website and uh, look at their FAQs, likely your question is there. If not, uh, call the call center. I guess the other thing that I'll say for those of the, us that remember this presentation from Friday, the county had an email address for this legal hotline. Uh, they have taken away that email address because they really feel that they are answering sort of most of the questions. So they, uh, most of the answers are up on the FAQ website or call the legal hotline. Um, another question is, since the city has closed all of its um, public facilities, and I believe most cities in San Mateo County have as well, the concern becomes a sanitation concern. We, we don't have a huge homeless population here in San Bruno, um, but overall in the peninsula there is, in the aggregate, a large homeless population. And so the question becomes, where do, the, where do they go to use the restroom? Is it a concern that the city is addressing or are we planning for? So we've uh, contacted our homeless outreach uh, uh, team from Life Moves, and, and, and that has been a, a unique concern. Uh, what I would say globally, uh, countywide, uh, is the county um, is uh, particularly focused on every city um, that has a uh, significant homeless population and doing specific um, measures for that community, right? Whether it's putting in a porta potty because they know that um, a lot of the facilities are closed, or doing the outreach and sort of saying, you know, we have hotel rooms. It's not just a, a shelter bed. You know, we have hotel rooms available, and the county has put real money behind that uh, and, and um, um, buying out hotel rooms to get people off the street at this time. Uh, in San Bruno, um, yes, we have a homeless population. Uh, no, it's not as prevalent as some of the other areas in the. Uh, in uh, in the county, but we are very cognizant of that, uh, and working with our outreach coordinator, Life Moves. Um, you know, w one of the sort of uh, truths here is that uh, a number of the individuals um, uh, are more regular homeless population. They are known uh, by our outreach workers, and so that personal outreach has happened and will continue to happen. Okay. 
Um, and then the, uh, I just wanted to ask about the collaboration with the school district. I know this came up on, on Friday too, but since this is uh, probably a more broadly watched meeting, I wanted to ask what's going on with the communication with the school district around the schools being closed and, and any private schools as well. Fair. So we continue to work very closely uh, with the Sam, um, San Mateo Union High School District and the uh, San Bruno Park School District uh, and are working on a uh, collaborative communication. Really what we're waiting for there is for the district, um, uh, specifically the San Mateo um, Park School District, to finalize their distance learning plan and then we want to jointly push that out and the cable department is in contact with them uh, for potentially a way where we can uh, provide youth that do not have internet service at home uh, but reside in San Bruno uh, to potentially acquire um, uh, internet through um, San Bruno City Net Services. Uh, the district is also working uh, with a philanthropic organization on purchasing hotspots, uh, wireless hotspots for individuals that uh, may not that may go to the district but do not uh, reside full time in San Bruno. Uh, and so they are uh, looking at that. And, and we are definitely in close communication with them. We have a school liaison uh, as a part of our emergency operations center that touch bases with them every day, as well as our PIO team uh, is reaching out to them and offering support. Okay, just a, a couple more questions. Um, and just in line with that, I, I think when one really um, valuable resource in San Bruno is the San Bruno Education Foundation, and, and it was not mentioned. Um, so I just want to let um, the public know that right now there is an active fundraiser on the San Bruno Education website, which is www.sbefkids.org. And specifically, the fundraiser is to, uh, for kids to access computers and internet, uh, our most disadvantaged kids right here in San Bruno. Um, and their uh, mailing address is P.O. Box 175, San Bruno, California, 94066, if anybody wants to write a check. Um, but again, as of today, the fundraiser's only been open about, actually, it's been open already five days, and they've only raised $395, comparatively speaking, to cities like Redwood City, who within two days had ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. So I really want to encourage San Bruno residents to give to our own most disadvantaged children um, through donating to the San Bruno Education Foundation. Um, the last question I have is in regards to the, um, the up to $3 million that the council approved on Friday. Uh, when will the city council receive an update on what money has been spent and how often will we be receiving those updates and, and what is that money being spent on? Fair. Uh, and so we're preparing that information for our conversation at the next council meeting, April 14th. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Salazar said he's good and thank you for the, uh, the report and the information and I was going to say very quickly because I know we want to move on is that um, I spoke with Leslie today just to check since the website went out for folks that may have needs or that may want to volunteer and of course the community that we're blessed to have uh, has obviously been wanting to come forward or service groups to volunteer but we've had only uh, at this time as of this morning one person that may uh, need some assistance, but that was actually done by the police department and referred that uh, person. And uh, kind enough that there is a person at City Hall, a city employee that knows this person and has taken uh, that on in order to ensure that that person is taken care of uh, in the city. So again, thank you to the PD and thank you to the staff member at City Hall, uh, but that's as of uh, today. So, but again, that is an avenue and outlet in order if services are needed or that um, you wish to assist in our local community. So thank you to the city manager. Thank you for your report. Let's move on to item B. The 2020 census is here. Be informed, be involved, be counted. More information available on the, si the city website or by visiting the county website at www.smccensus.org. I like that. See, that's taking the right precaution, Jimmy. Thank you. So, so our public works director uh, will be doing that as he took the precaution to wipe down everything before starting. So thank you.
Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, Jimmy Tan, Public Works Director. I'm here to provide a brief update on the Crestmore Canyon um, project. So with all that's going on, I do have a little bit of a good news um, to share. Uh, since our last council meeting on March 10th, we've made uh, great uh, progress on this project. The one remaining tieback passed the performance test on March the 16th. Then starting on March 18th, the contractor began the shotcrete application on the wall. Several of those potholes um, along within San Bruno Avenue that were excavated to determine the depth of the existing 230 kV and high pressure gas pipeline utilities were restored. And lastly, the contractor began cleaning up the, uh, the construction site. On, I have some pictures to share from the work activities. This is the picture of the wall that shows all of the rebars uh, uh, installed. Here's another picture of the wall and the hillside that's been excavated. A picture of the tie back uh, location. Again, more walls and rebars. And those little white um, pipes that are coming down from the wall, those are the drain pipes. Um, here, the contractor is filling the existing um, pothole uh, with, the, with the CDF, which is controlled density fill, slurry mix. Here's a shot creep application that's being applied to the wall. It's another picture. And this is close to the final completion of the, um, the wall here. And this is currently a, a state, the state uh, right now. Um, and this is a picture, you know, if you get close to the sidewalk, you'll be able to see where the wall's location is, but then there's a steep drop uh, into canyons. So what we're planning to do with the next steps is to install guardrails at the location where you saw the barricades um, and the, the wire fence on top of the, the wall that's been installed um, so that we don't we prevent any, you know, any vehicles or any people you know, crossing the, um, you know, going over the, um, you know, the side there. So in addition to that, we'll be removing and replacing the sidewalks. Um, the cost for that is about approximately $23,000, about 145 feet of uh, sidewalks and curb will also will be replaced. Um, both the eastbound and westbound lanes of San Bruno Avenue is um, from Crestmore Avenue to Caltrans right of way near Skyline Boulevard is also being proposed to be repaved. We haven't gotten a cost for that yet. It's been, um, we've contacted several paving contractors to try to get the cost for that. Um, so this concludes my presentation. I think we're majority of the, the most, the biggest uh, portion of the work is complete already. So the next thing is just to do these three um, additional steps and we'll be finished with our project. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Questions. And again, this was in regards to the uh, uh, status of the local emergency related to the repairs of the Crestmore Canyon and continuing the declaration of local emergency. Since we're almost, uh, we're getting near complete, uh, do you have a, an estimate time is when you think this uh, might may be complete and then therefore the declaration is closed out? Correct, so th we're thinking that the, uh, the guardrails and the sidewalks can be done probably by the um, middle of April is what we're looking at. Um, resurfacing, it's, it's unknown whether the paving contractors are available at this moment. That's something that we're, we're currently checking. Uh, with them in regards to the schedule as we're getting the cost for them. So we're thinking that if everything goes well, probably by mid-May uh, is what we're looking at to have all, everything, uh, the roadway repaved. Right, thank you. Other questions or comments from council? The chair? Marty. Yes, um, it's great to see all the progress. Thank you. Um, as for the resurfacing, is that um, going to be paid through Measure A funds? part of the paving part, or is that considered part of the emergency fund? Yes, uh, currently it's, it's um, that's something that to be evaluated, and the paving can come from the Measure A uh, or you know, funds. Um, it, since we're still under the emergency you know, declaration, that's something that we have to discuss whether the funds sh should come out of the emergency fund or not. So uh, then we'll, we'll discuss that internally. Um, and, and we'll hear, that. excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, and we'll hear back before that decision is made. Um, it seems like the emergency part, after you put the guardrails back up, I would, I would agree that the emergency is over. 
um, paving in San Bruno um, is needed everywhere. In a, in a lot of places, let me, let me rephrase that. So um, I look forward to, to, to hearing that decision um, and getting this emergency uh, past us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Chair. Uh, the city manager wanted to respond and then uh, Michael. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. We'll come back to the city council if we um, uh, think it's advantageous to uh, pin that additional roadway to this project. I mean, as the council knows, sometimes there are benefits to do things with economies of scale. And while we didn't plan to repave that, that section, uh, there may be uh, significant benefits to doing it now because we will be, will be repaving uh, the section wh where the slide occurred. The other thing I want to sort of remind the council about is that there was an additional uh, component of work that was a part of this project. It was a $400,000 component to shotcrete the hillside. Uh, the going thinking is that uh, the repair went uh, very well and the engineers believe that uh, that is something that uh, we uh, may be able to not do at this time. Uh, but a final decision on that has not been made. And so we will, uh, when we come back for um, later reports, we'll give you a final determination on if we think that it's um, beneficial to do that extra $400,000 uh, project to create, it's called shot creek, but essentially a concrete um, uh, um, um, area around that entire mouth of where the slide occurred uh, as an added measure of protection. Uh, but that was in the total budget that was provided to you uh, the first time. Michael. Thank you. Uh, my question was just about uh, overall, now that most of the, um, the significant portion of the construction work is done, um, how the, we were tracking to budget and um, uh, there's going to be a lot of demand on those emergency funds coming up. And so I was just wondering how we were tracking to that budget yeah. plan. Yeah, so we have um, three large um, contracts that we've issued. One was to a hillside drilling for $580,000. Uh, that's to do all the, uh, the tie backs and the wall construction work. We also issued about another contract to Cotton Showers and Associates uh, for $67,500, which was the geotech firm that has been assisting with inspection as well as the um, uh, engineering uh, for it. Uh, and then we also had a contract our, um, for C2R Engineering, which is the, the contractor that installed the the um, HDP pipeline for the storm drain uh, that went down to um, down the, um, the canyon. So the, again, that was about a, close to $104,000 for that. So the total of all that is close to, um, I would say about $800,000. We have some change orders um, that we're looking into right now, uh, uh, hoping to negotiate that with the contractor. Uh, we're thinking about this approximately about $40,000 change order, which is less than 10% of the, the construction contract. So. He hasn't given me all of the the cost information yet. That's something that I'm looking forward to, um, you know, discussing with him once I receive the information. Um, and then, of course, you know, with the added cost of that, it depending on how much the paving cost comes in, whether or not it's included as part of Measure, measure A or the uh, emergency fund, we could be looking at it maybe close to about um, about a million dollars once this whole project is complete. Okay. And, and what was the original estimate that we started with? I think in 1.3 years, I think it's what I'm calling. I don't have the exact number on top of my, but that's what I'm remembering right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions or comments from council? Through the chair. Laura. Um, Jimmy, also in one of the, the very last, well, first of all, thank you for the fabulous photos because it really, those pictures are worth a thousand words and I really appreciate seeing the progress of this project all along. In fact, all your presentations have been fabulous. Um, just to again reassure residents who live in the area, you know, there's one section of the hill that slid, but somebody lives sort of across the canyon, another area. Um, and, I, and I remember you saying this, but there's plenty of sort of space um, between their property and where these hillsides. In one of the images, the previous one, you kind of see a, a hillside that's already sort of dropped on the other side of that canyon. But I know that space is very vast, and so there are no homes and no neighborhoods in any type of danger from hill sliding. So. That's correct. Um, there are no houses that are being impacted by this, and um, there's you know there's eastbound and westbound lanes of San Bruno Avenue. There's two lanes in, in each direction plus the median, and the house across the street is very far away from the um, the, the hillside area. So, and now that it has been mitigated, we don't foresee any issues with the you know the uh, the roadway being impacted in the future. 
Thank you. Any other questions or comments from council? If not, Jimmy, thank you for your thank report. You. And we'll move on to consent calendar. Uh, there are two items on consent, items A and B. Uh, is there anybody who wants to remove one of those items for a separate vote? Is there anybody who wishes to have a question or comment on either of those uh, items before we take action? Any action from council? Motion to approve. Second. Motion made and second to approve the consent. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 5 0 voice. We'll move on to item six, public hearing. Public hearing. Hold a public hearing to receive the 2019 Housing Element Annual Progress Report and authorize transmittal to the California Department of Housing and Community Development and Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Yep, please. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Pamela Wu and I'm the City's Planning and Housing Manager. I have the pleasure to provide you with a report for the 2019 Housing Element Annual Progress Report. The objective for tonight is to hold a public hearing to receive the 2019 Housing Element Annual Progress Report and authorize the transmittal to the California Department of Housing and Community Development and Governor's Office of Planning and Research. The agenda for tonight, I will first start with the objective for tonight's action. Then I'll present the annual housing progress report and follow with an update on various housing programs. And finally, I'll conclude with staff's recommendation for tonight's action. To provide you with a little bit of background, each local jurisdiction in the state of California, including San Bruno, is required by state law to prepare an annual progress report on the status and progress of implementing the housing element of the general plan. The report is due annually by April 1st for the calendar year, immediately re preceding the reporting deadline, and the city is required to hold a public hearing before the city council and accept public comments. The April 1st due date is in a statute and remains effective at this time, even with the COVID-19 emergency. Since 2018, the report forms has been updated to incorporate new reporting requirements based on new state laws. These new reporting requirements include more detailed data about housing development application in the city and are presented in attachment, at attachment one to your staff report. The report also focuses on the city's progress towards implementing its housing element programs and meets its share of the regional housing needs allocation, aka the RENA number, and other housing goals. The, an the annual progress report is comprised of multiple tables. Table A and A2 provide information on new residential development in various stages of the development process and affordability level during 2019. Table B provides information about the permitted housing units by affordability levels to document the city's progress in meeting the RENA allocation. While San Bruno has no data to report for table C, E, F, and G, table D provides a detailed narrative status and progress of the housing element program and policy implementation. Table G is a newly added requirement pursuant to the 2019 state housing law update. This table shows the city's progress in issuing building permits for new housing construction to meet with the city's share of the RENA um, allocation needs by income category. The current housing element period covers eight years from 2015 through 2023. In 2019, the city of San Bruno issued building permits for a total of 49 new residential units. These consist of 17 accessory dwelling units, the ADUs, two single-family residential dwelling units, and 30 multifamily resi residential dwelling units, and they're both part of the Skyline College project. In 2019, the city only received a total of seven, uh, 12 new units for a housing development application, and they were all for ADUs. After the first five years of the eight-year planning cycle, the city has issued permits for a total of 168 new housing units. This leaves a remaining need for 987 housing units to be permitted over the next four years. 
while the previous table shows units for which a building permit for construction has been issued. However, the city has the opportunity this year to make significant progress towards meeting the city's housing needs allocation by the end of the housing element cycle. Based on development application, the city has approved that is currently processing and the on-tap development capacity in the transit corridor plan area. This slide shows a total of six development projects that are still in various stage of review, which include a total of 587 units. The annual progress report pro provides a list of housing element goals and programs as progress was achieved on the program in 2019. This slide highlights some of the most important achievement in 2019 towards implementation. This includes the adoption of city's development impact fee, parking requirement amendment as part of the zoning code update. This also includes ongoing implementation of the transit corridor plan that included the city council's approval for the 500 Sylvan residential project and the adoption for the downtown parking management plan and the San Mateo Avenue streetscape plan. There are other additional key achievements in 2019 toward implementation of the housing element goals and policy that include continuing coordination with the local school district on formal school site reuses. This includes the processing um, entitlement application to allow Stratford School to utilize the El Cristo school site and also to partner up with the Park School District to prepare a, to prepare a land use uh, information for the MVAL school RFP. As previously mentioned, Council adopted a parking requirement amendment to allow various parking strategies and an updated parking requirement for multifamily residential uses. In regard to the city's affordable housing impact fee fund and new strategies to implement the program, the city council also adjusted the impact fee in November 2019 and also authorized funding to retain a professional consultant to develop an affordable housing fund implementation plan which include policy options and funding opportunities for the programming of the current $3.8 million in housing impact fee. In the future, the city is anticipated to, to, to receive additional funds. As well as in, in November 2019, the city council considered enacting an urgency ordinance to provide interest rent stabilization and just cause eviction protection to tenants in advance to AB 1482. Lastly, the city continues to support life moves and participates in its countywide quarterly homelessness advisory committee meetings. Life moves supports the city in working closely with homeless individuals and their families, such as providing services for those who are on the street or in a vehicle. Life moves ultimate goal is to establish stable housing and long-term self-sufficiencies for the homeless population. The staff report also includes a brief summary of local efforts to remove governmental constraints to the maintenance, improvement, and development of housing. However, in 2019, there has not been significant accomplishment in this area. The city continues to examine various funding sources for affordable housing and examine internal and external policy constraints. In terms of state housing law update, on October 9, 2019, Governor Gavin Newsom signed into law a housing package that included approximately 20 new housing laws. An overview of these housing laws is organized in attachment two of your staff report. In conclusion, staff recommends City Council to re receive the housing element annual progress report for 2019 and also authorize the transmittal to the California Department of Housing and Community Development and the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. This action will, re will ensure the report is transmitted before the deadline of April 1st. Thank you, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Pamela, for your report. Uh, so first, keep in mind this is a public hearing and uh, obviously we don't have uh, members of the public here honoring the stay, uh, stay in place and at home. I have checked with Joanne there have been no emails thus far communicated. So are there questions or comments from our council? Mm -hmm. A question. So Linda. there was mention of the 2019 state housing law update. Um, have, have our 
zoning codes and our, all of our rules, have they been reconciled with each other and all the new laws to ensure that they're consistent? We're in the progress of doing that. And, and what is the time frame for that? Um, there are multiple steps um, and also involvement. We're hoping, and I'm looking at uh, city attorney and city manager, possibly towards the end of this year. Oh, great, thank you. Um, and then my other question is regarding the 1,155 unit requirement. Um, we have 987 apparently remaining. So can you just talk a little bit about, or, or maybe this is a city manager question, I'm not sure, but what has happened to other cities who have not met their arena requirements? So um, up until now, uh, the arena requirements have been um, a requirement that the city zone for enough housing. There has not been a requirement that the cities produce the housing because we don't produce housing, right? The, the private sector does. Uh, increasingly, uh, I think what you see with Scott, uh, State Senator Scott Weiner, uh, the governor, and other legislators, uh, due to the extreme housing crisis that we're in, there are um, more and more um, draft pieces of legislation, uh, uh, certainly over the last few years, SB 50 is the prime example, but there are sister bills and a number of things that, that didn't pass, but there are the continual um, potential legislative actions that will uh, penalize cities uh, if you do not approve housing projects when they come to you. Uh, and so uh, we know that our arena numbers will increase. Uh, I would say just globally, though, we know that we are in an extremely uh, tough housing market and we are in, uh, in, a, in a, um, a housing crisis at all levels of affordability. And so um, the, the spirit of arena is that we actually allow housing to be built. Uh, and and uh, I think that's something that uh, I know we're all working towards. And um, the other piece is we know that COVID-19 uh, and uh, the downturn in the economy uh, and the potential recession may impact that. And so we, we need to continue uh, to work towards that um, and uh, work toward um, making housing happen where we can. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you. Chair? Marty. So I just want to um, thank you for the report and also just add a couple questions. Um, understandably, there's, a, there's been a lot of talk and uh, legal uh, legisl legislation uh, uh, for housing. This, um, there's a five years, I'm sorry, eight years, 2015 to 2023? That is correct. Um, so we, we have three more years to make these numbers? That's correct. Oh, 20, 21, 22, 23. You have, we have four years, including this year. Including this year, right. So we have four more years to meet, reach these numbers. I, I, I feel fairly confident that we're going to be able to meet um, the above moderate, moderate numbers um, even the low ones, because we only need 27 more units there. My concern is the very low, where we have to make up 358 units. That's correct. Well, okay, that's a lot bigger than mine. Yeah, all right. Um, what are what what uh, what should the council be doing for that? Um, being that it takes a couple of years generally to get a big project through and to get 358 units of the very low seems like a big challenge and I'm just curious to see what staff has in plan to address that. Sure. Um, Marty, I think the first thing I want to say is um, the, the numbers that you reported, um, uh, we should look at the very last column. And so to the, the ground we would need to make up over the next four years is 967 units. And so it's, uh, it's not 27 low, it's 94 low units that are remaining, 168 moderate and 377 above moderate. I stand corrected, you're absolutely right. Um, and then the very low is really close to, to the amount of the moderate units that, that we need to make up. 
and that's 358. I would say, um, uh, to address your question, the best thing that we can do is to incentivize economic development and when uh, projects come before us, uh, figure out a way to partner with the private um, community, be they residential projects or commercial. Uh, for residential projects, we know that the city of San Bruno has a 15% affordability requirement. And so if uh, someone is proposing to build um, 100 units, they have to provide 15% uh, of those affordable, affordable units. And so that's 15 units and they can be at various levels of affordability. They could also pay into an in lieu fee, uh, but we have, uh, as of late, really wanted to focus on having the units provided on site. Um, and negotiate for additional units when, uh, where we can. And so I think one of the things the city council can do is uh, when you get a affordable house, a market rate housing project before you uh, that meets the affordability threshold of 15%, know that by approving that market rate project, you're also approving um, affordable housing projects. I think the other thing that the city council can do is uh, when you have private commercial development, um, like the Bay Hill specific plan that will be coming before the council shortly. Uh, as a part of that, there is a uh, affordable housing linkage fee uh, that is a part of that uh, build out. And I think that when we were here a few months ago, the number is just over $20 million uh, that would be provided to the city for our affordable housing trust fund as uh, for, for the total build out of what is uh, uh, proposed by YouTube. With that 20 million, you can actually help to subsidize the very low units. And, and uh, one of the hardest, out of all of those categories, the very low are the hardest to provide and they require the most subsidy. And so oftentimes there's municipal dollars that, that needs to go into those. And right now we have a affordable housing trust fund that has $3 million in it. And so leveraging that uh, by approving uh, private development would provide the council with the resources to invest into those very low units. I think the other thing we can do is to look at city-owned property. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a lot of uh, property to offer, uh, but if we can identify city-owned parcels, uh, we can provide those to nonprofit developers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, again, with the cost of construction, sometimes there needs to be money that comes along uh, locally to make those happen too. And so we really need money in our affordable housing trust fund, not just, um, land. Thank you. Any other questions or comments of council? Uh, I just, Linda. I'm going to do right. chair. Laura, please. I just want to kind of piggyback on uh, Council Member um, Mason's comments earlier about, you know, what's the ramification when we don't meet these? And I think as times are changing, and we don't really know what's going to happen in the next few years, this construction that we anticipated to happen is not going to happen. And so I think a lot of these numbers, even for the future, I'm worried about. Um, you know, they, they may look good today, but they may not happen. So I just think it's that much more important that, you know, when projects come our way, that sort of check all the boxes. Um, and even if it's not an ideal situation that we would all want, we need to think about housing and, and, and requirements um, because this, this is, these are important. This is important to really support our, our community. Michael, thank you. So, um, you know, as we start looking at um, the economic landscape going forward and just our ability to generate that many units in the time frame, um, what what other um, recourse would the city have if we're getting to the point where it's obviously we're not going to make it and probably a lot of cities are in the same position where they're not going to make those numbers so um, is there any effort to work with the state to either change those expectations or rethink what they're putting out there and try to come up with a more reasonable or appropriate solution um. I wish we would have a chance to talk to the state to reconsider the numbers. Um, as you mentioned, a lot of cities are in the same boat. A lot of cities have uh, worked really hard to try to get those expectations up, and a lot of cities are suffering from the number of units. Um, we are working on a number of projects that will be coming before the council for consideration. Um, as the city manager has alluded, I would just urge the city council to consider those projects as we bring them forward. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Pamela. Uh, I'm being informed that we do have somebody who has emailed in. Uh, this is a public hearing, and that's the reason I didn't ask for it to be closed, that we gave it enough opportunity and time. So at this time, um, we're going to ask Pamela if you would step back a little bit for that safe space. And um, Joanne, if you would mind coming up to the podium and reading the uh, comment or question from the member of the public. Dear Honorable San Bruno City Council, my name is Alex Melendrez and I make this comment only on my own behalf. I would like to highlight the necessity for more housing and affordable housing in San Bruno. We especially need housing for the very low and extremely low income housing. Public land is a great, great resource for developing affordable housing. Inclus inclusionary housing, affordable housing included in market rate housing is also a great option. Even market rate housing has its place in assuring local displacement does not take place by providing our workers a place to stay. I believe the current COVID-19 crisis highlights how much the jobs housing imbalance plays how traffic is affected by lack of housing. The need for shelter at all income levels is the great moral issue of our time. I apologize for my late and quick comment. Sincerely, and wishing good health, Alex Melendrez. Thank you, John, very much. Okay, so I'm gonna, I, with there being no other public uh, comment or hearing at this time, I'd like to make a motion or have a motion that uh, to close the public hearing. I move that we close the public hearing. Is second. A motion made and second to close the public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so now we're going to bring it back to the City Council. Were there additional questions or comments, uh, Pamela or other staff? If not, uh, this would need a motion and a second in order to, if we want to authorize. To the Chair, just one final comment. Um, sure. So I think development, I mean, it's unfortunate tonight we're in a situation where we, are where we have really no public comment um, except for uh, one resident. But I think housing is such an important aspect of the city, and I know we've talked about this, but I just want to really state this publicly that we need to, at some point, look at having uh, an open town hall, some sort of discussion to really educate the public. Because housing isn't about a decision we make today for tomorrow. It's about a decision we make today for years in advance. I mean, if you think about Measure N and how long it took to start that process, it was well over 10 years to actually pass that. So, you know, we can't approve a project today that we haven't really thought about five and 10 years ago. Um, and, and unfortunately, the, the numbers end in 2023, but the city is going to be given a new set of numbers to meet, and those numbers are going to be, you think these are bad, they're going to be worse than we're seeing today. So we as a city really need to th start thinking long term, how do we get there in 10 years? How do we get to that number? And in that process, how do we educate our residents? How do we educate the residents to understand the process, to understand the requirements, um, and that they're clear and they don't feel it's last minute, we didn't tell them, we didn't share them, we're trying to, to approve a project without them knowing about it, that we really got to think about the communication plan that we have with the residents, getting them to understand the, uh, the, the process with new development. And I think that there's an education, and I think a lot of people don't understand that process. And so I think it's really important that we look at what long-term plan is and we look at educating the, the community. And, and the final thing would be a, a good communication plan the residents go, I got a place, I got a location, I'm not even get notified. There's multiple ways we notify our customer, our residents, and I feel like everything's above board and nothing's happening without me knowing about it. And uh, also to add on, I would think also just some of the projects, Pamela, that you had brought forward, it is, it is uh, sometimes, been some time that folks are reminded about truly all the projects that are going on in, in, in the community and what has already been like 500 uh, silver has been approved. We need to remind folks of things that are in place and that are hopefully moving forward. But I think also what Council Member uh, Davis said, I think it is important going forward too. Uh, it is a bigger part of our community that really wants to be engaged and be informed. If they make the decision or choice not to want to come to one of the meetings or with a developer or uh, that, then that's okay. 
but we want to afford them those opportunities and the availability in which to come forward and to express within this community. It's not just about my neighborhood or your neighborhood, it really is about the city and its future. So I really think that it is important that we have a clear process that we communicate with the developer, that the city takes some ownership too when it goes to uh, reaching out to the residents in this community. So we're assured that the right list is being used, the right people are getting the information, and it, and it gets across many levels of opportunity for folks to be uh, knowledgeable, educated, feel uh, empowered, and feel the ability in which to have their voices heard. So is there any other comments? To the mayor. Mr. Mayor. We'll go back. the chair. Marty. Um, yeah, so the council had a retreat and we talked about setting priorities and, and having a meeting to have priorities and a priority, I think, from my understanding of the council is, is to move forward with housing. But as my colleagues have just said, we need to make sure that we have a clear process with the, with the communication um, we could learn from our neighboring cities. Burlingame brought in Home for All, which had a bunch of community meetings that educated the public um, before the project was even brought forward. So that is something that we could look forward to, and, I, and, and I, I'm looking to have that priority setting meeting so we can give clear direction of what we want to do um, for this coming year, and, and we have to be thinking longer range. And um, so um, I'll leave it at that. And, and I know we, uh, this COVID-19 has derailed a lot of, of staff time and, and rightly so because it is extremely important. So um, I don't know if the city manager can give us an, an update when we're gonna talk about priorities again. If, because everybody's so busy, but I think it's coming pretty soon, is that correct? Well, hold on, can, can we st stick on the topic of the of the report and then we can certainly circle back around to that unless that's relevant to the decision on the transmittal? Is that okay? I, I think it's, it's important to, to um, acknowledge that we, we as a council are looking at setting these priorities and, 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 and uh, we can take a short answer later, but Moving forward with yeah. this, I support this transmittal. Okay, let me get Michael, who's been waiting. Michael? Thank you. So um, I wanted to uh, echo what uh, Council Member Davis said. I, I have heard a lot of the same concerns, and I think it is important for, um, for us as a council to be educated on the process and the public to understand what the process looks like. So when projects do come forward, uh, it's very clear uh, what steps are going to be taken, what the time frames are and so that we don't have any surprises uh, at the end of the process. But uh, uh, overall, I agree there is a, a regional need for housing. Um, uh, something else I just want to uh, reiterate is that um, we, we do need to keep an eye on what's happening regionally because um, the, the economy is definitely being impacted right now. Um, I know San Francisco has made some decisions on what they're doing with their development and they're tying new um, new commercial um, activity to um, their low income residential uh, and so they, they they're going to limit their growth and so if a major city like san francisco that's uh, an immediate neighbor makes changes i i feel that that could um, change the landscape and any uh, future planning that uh, um, that we might be working on it, it could be impacted um, and I don't know that, um, I mean, it's gonna, the, the gap right now is huge, but uh, we certainly don't want to go down a trajectory where we're going to start building houses and then and by the time they're all done, nobody's going to live in them. So um, I just want to make sure that um, we're cognizant of, of those bigger things that are happening uh, regionally, statewide, and um, just make sure that, you know, what we're doing still makes sense um, as we reevaluate and things continue to change. Are there any more uh, questions or comment on the transmittal of the uh, California Department of Housing and Community Development? Yeah, I just have one. Um, just oh, a, yes, Linda. Sorry, the, um, just also echoing, I've been pretty consistent on my message, even as a planning commissioner, that we need some improved communications 
um, and I want to not just stick to the communications with residents, um, but also the communications around residents and how meaningful they are. So not just hosting a meeting to host a meeting, but to answer the questions that residents are really concerned about, which, you know, in, in some of the um, concerns that, I, that were raised that I had heard was, what are the impact of these developments on our water? What are the impacts of these developments on our sewer systems? What are the impacts of these developments on our school systems? Um, I remember attending a school board meeting where it was very clear to me that the uh, appointed administration uh, was completely unaware of the RENO requirements and were not taking those into consideration um, when considering future impacts on our schools, on our public schools here in San Bruno. Um, so I think it's really important that not only are the communications with the residents meaningful and that our facilitators are prepared, but that all of our partner agencies are aware of what's going on and that our requirements are requirements. We're going to have to meet them and this is actually happening. Um, and lastly, I wanted to say that there are other cities who've implemented communication plans that have a specific requirement um, that triggers that public comment period, which we currently don't have. I think in Burlingame, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe any development over 10 units triggers a public process. And so I'd love to see us actually create and approve a, a communications plan that includes that um, sooner rather than later. Thank you. Ms. Linda? Okay, this, just, uh, this does need a motion and a second uh, in order for the transmittal. Is there any action? So moved. Second. Motion made and second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 5 0 voice. And then circling back around uh, to Marty, uh, just as far as the potential ETA or what we had discussed in February at the retreat. Sure. At the February uh, retreat, uh, with regard to priority setting, um, well, we were planning to have two subsequent meetings, uh, one with regard to policies and procedures, the other with regard to policy setting. Um, I believe the date that we were looking at for the um, priority setting was uh, March 31st. Uh, I believe we did a poll and not all council members uh, could make that date, and so we will be looking for an, another date uh, that, that that could occur. In addition, um, there was a number of uh, information that was sent out uh, via email for uh, council members to um, initially sort of collect their uh, collect their their individual ide ideas on what the priorities for the organization could be, and, and we had a process where we would um, uh, ship those out to all of you guys and have you rate them. But I know COVID-19 has sort of thrown a wrench into everything, uh, and hopefully we will be approaching a new normal <laughs> later on this week, and so. I know we have a lot of staff that are sort of waiting to pick up uh, projects that uh, got put by the wayside, and so uh, we'll make sure that we uh, get to that uh, for the rest of this week, and uh, hopefully we are at a new normal, and uh, we won't sort of have our EOC uh, planning for a pandemic, and we can go back to more regular work. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to con conduct of business. Conduct of business, 7A, receive report. receive report and confirm date for transition to a by-district method of city elections. Consider adopting a resolution appropriating $45,000 from the general fund balance and authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with National Demographics Corporation for districting services. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, Zebron. members of the City Council. Tonight we're going to talk about a couple of things relating to district elections. And um, we're going to review, whoops, we're, we're going to wait for the PowerPoint to get up there. Okay, we're going to review the background from uh, last meeting, March 10, 2020. We're going to evaluate the pros and cons of transitioning to district elections in either 2020 or 2022. That was a decision that was uh, deferred at the last meeting. We're going to address some of the questions that were raised at the last meeting and in the interim. And we're going to talk a little bit about next steps. And so those are essentially to determine what is that date going to be and then secondarily to decide whether to retain the National Demographics Corporation, the consultant that presented at the last meeting and uh, will be on the phone here this evening in order to answer any questions. So let's start with a little background. At the last meeting, we received a staff report uh, regarding the options 
to mitigate the city's exposure to a potential California Voting Rights Act claim and attorney's fees. And what you'll remember about that is that that act requires public agencies to transition from at-large to district elections. And uh, we also learned that receiving a letter from an attorney, which Burlingame had just done uh, merely days before the meeting, could trigger a payment of up to $32,000 in attorney's fees. Uh, and we have actually just heard that Burlingame is actually going to end up paying that uh, as they transition now to district elections. Uh, we also heard from the consultant at the last meeting that litigation and other court settlements could range from six to seven figures. So the financial liability, potential liability to the city was great from not having adopted a resolution of intention. So you received a detailed presentation at the last meeting from the demographer and uh, the city council had uh, quite a bit of discussion about mitigating the risk and, and eventually adopted a resolution of intention uh, which does protect it and provides it with a safe harbor. And the only decision left outstanding regarding that resolution of intention was whether the transition to district elections should be in 2020, so this November, or in 2022. So let's talk about that for just a couple of minutes. And uh, here come some of the policy issues, the pros and cons of going one way versus the other. So uh, with respect to the consultant's work, uh, we have confirmed that it is possible to complete uh, all of the required steps that are required under state law. It requires five public hearings, uh, which is uh, quite, quite a large number of public hearings, and perhaps especially so in these times. So we checked with our consultant and I think he's recommended that if we are going to go in 2020, we really are going to need a much more intense and robust public outreach to get public participation remotely. Because as you can see, uh, with the shelter in place order, we're unlikely to have large members of the public or large numbers of, of the public coming out to these meetings. And so in order to foster public participation at home and drawing maps online and interacting uh, over uh, tech, you know, with teleconferencing and so on, there's going to need to be quite a bit more public outreach if we're going to try to go in 2020. And that comes with, with I think, a substantial additional expense that the consultant can tell you a little bit about. There is a, a little bit of good news, uh, which is that the risk of paying attorney's fees and or litigation for waiting until 2022 is now reduced. As maybe some of you know, the governor issued one of many executive orders recently for in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of those orders extended all of the time frames for required public hearings after an emergency specifically relating to this. So I think that if the city council did want to wait until 2022, there would be a relatively low risk in, in doing that. And the last policy consideration is uh, waiting until 2022 would also allow for a more robust discussion of possible changes to a charter city, which was brought up last time and we'll talk about a little more in just a minute, and also alternative voting mechanisms in conjunction with district elections. If we were to try to do all of those things and go in 2020, I think uh, it's an understatement to say that would be a, a challenge, but the consultant has indicated that it's possible. Let's address just a couple of the questions that uh, were raised at the, the last meeting. So the, the first one in touching on the issue I just mentioned, which is what about considering alternative voting mechanisms? And you, you might remember at the last meeting, uh, there was a gentleman from a uh, academic a think tank uh, who's involved in uh, voting, uh, studying voting mechanisms of all kinds, and he had a, a number of intriguing proposals that the city might wish to consider. So the one thing to remember, uh, if it wasn't clear at the last meeting, is uh, that does not actually provide, adopting those voting mechanisms do not provide a safe harbor and do not comply with the California Voting Rights Act in and of themselves. You still have to go to district elections if you want that safe harbor. Once you've made the decision to go to district elections or simultaneously, you can decide 
okay, we want to now implement some other alternative voting mechanism. And if you want to do that, you have to change to a charter city. And that requires an election because general law cities are, are not, uh, there, there's no provision in state law to allow all of those various uh, interesting voting mechanisms that uh, we, we heard about at the last meeting. So those are two uh, challenges with dealing with alternative voting mechanisms that could certainly be uh, studied uh, robustly for 2022, perhaps not as much, uh, if at all, for 2020. Uh, and another question that was raised is whether the city could coordinate consultant work uh, with the, the, uh, the school district. So that was an interesting idea because uh, you think that maybe the consultant, uh, the, both, both agencies could save some money, uh, retain the consultant jointly and split the cost. And we've had a discussion with the consultant about that. Uh, that's, that's likely not uh, going to be a feasible alternative for a couple of different reasons. The first of all is the school district boundaries are not contemporary, or not uh, coterminous uh, with the city's boundaries. So there's an area that's outside the city and it excludes an area inside the city. So there's little slivers that are inside and outside. And so that is gonna create a problem in uh, any, any sort of, um, we'll just do one map and share the cost. Uh, and uh, a second policy issue about that is that apparently uh, the mapping rules and criteria are different from for cities and school districts. And we're not aware that the school district has discussed this topic at a board meeting or uh, has made any steps with respect to this topic. And so I, I think the conclusion that we can draw from this is that it would be uh, difficult, if not uh, impossible and, and sort of not productive to have a sort of joint effort between the city and the school district on this particular topic. So what are the next steps that we're considering tonight? And there are really two. Uh, the first one is determine the date to transition to district elections. You made the decision last time. So now the question is November 2020 or November 2022. And then secondarily to decide whether uh, you'd like to retain NDC National Demographics Corporation to be your demographer for the effort. And obviously if you're going to do it in 2020, they need to be retained right away. If you're going to select 2022, then NDC can certainly assist in planning and evaluating the alternatives and they can, they can certainly start that process. So with that, I don't have any further comments. I'd be happy to answer any questions and I believe we'll uh, have or do have the consultant demographer, Doug Johnson, uh, on the telephone. Thank you. Yes, hello, and please still be here with me too. Can you repeat that, Doug? Oh, uh, I'm here, and Shalise Tilton, who was with me at the last meeting, is also on the line as well. All right, I am, I am being also informed before we open up to council uh, that there is somebody who has, uh, we have one for item 7A that had uh, provided to us earlier, and so we'll go ahead and read it at this time. From Aros Harmon, 633 Second Avenue. I do not believe it is a reasonable or, resp or responsible at this time to allocate $45,000 to immediately move forward with districts for the 2020 election. It is quite likely we will not be able to even begin a public engagement process for another few weeks due to COVID-19 crisis. If some lawyer wants to sue cities in the middle of this crisis, it seems to me that any judge or jury is going to recognize the frivolousness of that lawsuit in the current context, and we should have a valid countersuit against the lawyer to insist they cover court costs and some kind of damages for wasting the court and the city's time. We should declare our intent to adopt an election method consistent with the CVRA by the 2022 election after the current census, which also may be delayed. This, excuse me, this may be a by district method if it is determined that it is the only method to satisfy the CVRA, or may be a proportional method if study over the next year confirms that such a method would meet the goals of the CVRA better than districts. And we should consult more experts than simply one demographer whose income depends on drawing districts to determine whether alternate methods may be suitable. 
The Center for Election Science has funds available to help with adopting alternate election methods, whether by district approval or a proportional method, inclu including any equipment and software upgrades the county might need to, m to make to accommodate us and for voter outreach and education. Thank you very much, Joanne, for doing that. Okay, and that was the comment that was submitted today. Uh, now we'll open it up to council for questions and all comments. To either the uh, uh, via staff here or on the phone. Through the chair. Go ahead. Michael, got you by one second. One, uh, just one uh, correction. I noticed in the packet there was a copy of the resolution that was submitted last time and it showed a 5 0 volt vote. And I wanted to correct that because both Councilmember Mason and myself voted no on that. So that you're absolutely a uh, right, Councilmember Salazar. And in our haste, uh, we did not catch that. So we okay. apologize for that and we'll make just, sure that that gets corrected. Just for the record, in case I want to say I told you so. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Vice Mayor. Um, and um, so it, it looks like the recommendation today is slightly different. Uh, I think there was a little bit more of a urgency to uh, approve the 2020 date. Uh, the last time we met now, it seems that uh, given the situation, the 2022 20, date now is um, the more um, uh, beneficial. Um, solution. So um, I, I think that's definitely a, a better approach. It's going to give us more time to consider uh, how we want to do this. Um, I had a question about um, it, if we decide to, well, let me take a step back. So th there were a number of solutions that were mentioned last time uh, we had requested to sort of dig in a little deeper. Uh, into some of those options, but I, I believe what I'm hearing is that districting is the only thing that will satisfy the CVRA. I, I believe that is correct. We can have our demographer on the phone confirm that. I'm sorry, uh, Councilor Salazar, could you speak up? I couldn't hear any of what you said. I, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the question was uh, whether the districting solution is the only uh, solution that will satisfy the CVRA. Oh, it's the only safe harbor. So if you go to districts, no one can sue you. Um, if you do an alternative approach and everyone's happy with it, well, then there's no plaintiff to sue you. Um, if someone would prefer districts over your alternative approach, then you would go to court and have to debate over which system was better. So the only way to avoid the expense of a lawsuit is to have districts. Um, some of these systems will work with districts, but uh, that's the only safe harbor. The others, yes, you might win the case, but you're going to face a big challenge if, if any single person is dissatisfied. So let's just assume for a second that uh, lawsuits are not an issue and that we just want to do the right thing and um, the California Voter, Voters' Right Act is, is the right thing to do and we want to comply with it. Um, are there alternatives to districting that satisfy CVRA the way it's written? I'm sorry, you couldn't hear the end part of that. Well, there are alternatives to do what? Could, could we be compliant with CVRA and not have districts? I still can't hear you. Can we be compliant with the CVRA and not have districts? Is there any other method that would accomplish that? Not that would prevent a lawsuit. There might be something you could argue in court that does address the at-large system or the ability to elect, but you would not be in the safe harbor. You would have to, if any one person in the city disliked the new system, you'd have to win that lawsuit. Okay. All right. So that that uh, that clarifies the, um, the the lawsuit portion of it, I, I guess. Um, and are we going to get any additional information tonight regarding 
the um, move to a charter city and how that might either change what we're discussing here today or is that something that we would just uh, that we would get to eventually so Javon city manager we don't have any additional information on what a potential charter amendment uh, or, or, or potential effort to convert San Bruno from a general law city to a char charter city would look like uh, we can ask Doug Johnson to comment uh, generally on uh, if San Bruno was a charter city, uh, what that would allow or open up vis-a-vis -vis, uh, elections, okay. Elec the election of council members. And, and in terms of what the council can decide to do, so we, we have the power to change to a district from an at-large system by ordinance. That's correct. Okay. And do we also have the authority to add additional council seats? Uh, no, you do not. Okay. Not, not for general law city. If you, if you go to charter, the charter can determine, you can say we want to go to seven, nine, or have other additional seats. But a general law city is required by state law to have five seats. I, I, I thought that the state law said we had to have at least five. Isn't the language at least five? Yeah, which, which yeah the, me, this is like, Mark, it, it, it will actually allow seven or nine. Hmm. It's just those three options. Okay. So I can't correct it. All right. So, so yeah. then it would be within our authority as part of our plan to say, if we found a map that made more sense um, with, with seven, that we would have also the authority to do that. And I'm wondering, once we start looking at scenarios, and then this is to the consultant, uh, is the, uh, the realm of possibilities for us going to be tied to four districts and an at-large mayor, or are we going to look at different scenarios that include a uh, different number of council people and potentially a rotated mayor? What do we get for the money? Yes, so... Once you kick off the process and start the hearings, um, we have to do two hearings just to gather info. And then after those first two hearings have been held, we can start drafting maps. And yes, we can do whatever scenarios you want us to look at. Um, we've done that, done that fairly often. Okay, thank you. Can I, uh, I think it's possible answer. to clarify. Um, the council right now has the ability to look at adding additional council seats, right? Going from five to seven to nine. And what I think I heard Doug saying is if the city council embarked on that process, you can look into changing the number of council seats. I think it's important to point out that going from a directly elected mayor to a rotational mayor is something only the voters in San Bruno can decide. And so that was part of your initial question. I just want to point that out. Right. And, and w one thing I, w I was thinking about is if we were to say, okay, so if, even if we stick with five, and then we have, um, we have the five districts, but we would have four, basically four districts based yeah. on our current configuration. Yeah. Based on current law in San Bruno, which has a directly elected mayor, if the city council wanted to look at districts, we would, let's say today at your current status, it would be four districts and a directly elected mayor. If you wanted to go to seven council members, it would be six, di six districts and a directly elected mayor. The same uh, scenario for nine, eight districts and a directly elected mayor. The only way the city uh, can change Without having a direct, direct, you have to put it on the ballot. Right. Okay. Thank you. And we also have a, uh, an additional comment on item 7A, which uh, Joanne has and will read for us. And thank you for doing this. So this is a comment from Plymouth. Um, I, uh, the waiving of the Brown Act, with the waiving of the Brown Act and allowing meetings to take place virtually like this one, does it still make sense to cancel all meetings other than city council? It seems like we should keep as much city business running as possible if we can do it safely. I appreciate all the hard work being done by the city council and staff. It is reassuring to hear that so much preparation 
has been made and so many people are working hard to keep the city as safe as possible. I still think that dividing the city into districts is a bad idea and will result in worse representation for a lot of minority communities, not better. But even if we do have to do it, we should not be doing it now at a time when almost none of the city residents have a chance to speak out about it and when the city has much more pressing problems to deal with in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to have all our resources focused on keeping the city as safe as we can from this disease, which threatens both our health and our economy. All right, Michael's done for now. Uh, uh, other of my colleagues? I have some, some questions. Linda. Yeah, so is this, I'm sorry, what was his name? Doug, Doug Johnson. Doug Johnson. So, Mr. Johnson, I'm actually looking at your presentation at the League of Cities, um, wherein you lay out the process for um, changing over to at district elections. In particular, when you talk about the um, safe harbor provision, um, the safe harbor pr provision begins with receiving the demand letter. And then my understanding from your presentation is that you calculate 45 days from the date of the receipt of the demand letter. Then you have uh, the 45 days to decide which way to go. Uh, then you have another 90 days before an action can actually begin, a lawsuit can begin. Then the second step is you place the matter on a closed session um, with your city council. The third step is that you engage a demographer, which would be someone like yourself. Uh, once the demand letter has been received, then you would ask for two things. Uh, you'd ask for an analysis on the racially polarizing voting uh, record before transitioning to the district-based elections to see if they're necessary. And then the, districting, um, then the districting maps would go through essentially the city attorney, the city attorney for purposes of work product. And then lastly, the city council would retrieve the election results for the city's most recent elections um, and specifically, I think the example that's given, I'm going to just read it because it makes a lot of sense, which is that, for example, with some cities' perspective, plaintiffs cited the absence of minorities on the city council as evidence of racially polarized voting. Because a prospective plaintiff relied on surnames to determine whether minority candidates were elected to city council, plaintiffs' allegations fail to account for minority candidates who do not necessarily have minority surnames, such as a minority candidate who changed his or her last name after marriage. Reviewing the city's election history, the fact check, to fact check the allegations in the demand letter helps the city council make an informed decision. So I feel like none, none, none of this uh, as of right now has been followed um, and it appears that it's, that the safe harbor provision could apply if the city of San Bruno did receive uh, uh, one of these letters that we've, we've heard about so much. So, the, the, that is the process you follow if you get a letter. That was the whole purpose of that is what to do when you get a letter. And the goal of that analysis is to decide how strong a case the city has if it wishes to fight the letter. Um, and so you're, that's kind of a get ready for battle. We're going to go to the barricades and spend whatever it takes to fight it approach. Uh, what, what I think the council's done through its resolution at the last meeting is decide to get ahead of the curve, avoid the $30,000 that you have to pay when, to anyone who sends you a letter, even if you don't fight it, and just uh, adopt the resolution to make the change. So that, that's why we bypass those steps, is you're ahead of the curve and not reacting to a letter. Right, but none of, none of these steps say anything about having to pay $30,000. It appears that there's at least a hundred and... 35 days that the council would have to make an informed decision um, on its actions. And, and just to reiterate my position two weeks ago was that I wanted to ensure that we received all the information prior to um, handing over $45,000 to your firm to save $30,000. And it feels like in what I'm reading, if we did receive a letter, we would still have time to make a decision without spending $30,000. That's, that's not right. Okay, that's that's what I'd like to that, clarify. That's not the case, and I think the, I mean, Mr. Johnson can address that as well. W once you get the letter, then you're on the hook for paying up to thirty-two thousand dollars. That's exactly what happened in Burlingame. Is is that right, Mr. Johnson? 
just because I'm, yes. I'm looking at your they, presentation. You, the 32000 is paid to the attorney who sends you the letter. You'd have to hire the demographer, and, and actually that cost would be higher um, because you're talking about doing a, a liability analysis in addition to going to district collections. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at, the, at this point, we haven't received any information on the city's most recent elections to prompt us or to trigger us to move forward to say that we have, you know, that there's racial polarizing going on in San Bruno. We haven't had a closed session on this item. Um, we haven't received much more than the presentation that you provided two weeks ago, which was how to transfer over to district elections. And so um, I, I'm just trying to figure out exactly what uh, information we're relying on that is prompting us to move forward outside of a possible letter out of how many cities in California. Sure. Um, council member, let me take that. Um, one of the things that we said uh, at uh, two weeks ago uh, when this was brought up is that this item was jointly being placed before the city council by the city clerk, the city manager, and the city attorney, not to in any way push the city council towards district elections, but to allow the council to make an informed decision and to avoid the possibility of paying $30,000 like a, a lot of our neighboring jurisdictions in the county uh, have uh, and like a number of cities in California has because of the prevalence of attorneys going around uh, with the advent of state law to essentially just give a letter and, and collect $30,000 and um, then have the city launch this effort. What we wanted to do uh, was to be proactive and give the city council the option to adopt a resolution to provide protection so no one can send the city a letter, thus turning uh, what would be a, uh, if the city council went forward now or in 2022, a $40,000 effort into a 70,000 plus effort because you'd have to pay your demographer in either in either event plus the $30,000 and I think what we also heard from Doug Johnson is that in that case when you do get a letter you'll also be doing additional uh, analysis on uh, risk of lawsuit and, and mitigation and so your cost may very well be more than $40,000. Uh, and so the, the city council took an action at the last meeting that provided protection and the decision that's before the council is, do you want to do that in 2020 or 2022? Um, I think the other uh, point that's worth making is, um, yes, COVID-19 has sort of changed the landscape on everything and, and we're in a different place that we are um, today than we were two weeks ago. That said, what you also heard from staff is, should the city council want to proceed with 2020, we can uh, look into ways that that can occur. We will not be the only city that is going through a district election process, and so people are going to have to figure out how to do community engage engagement in this sort of new normal, uh, where you're having more remote participation, and you think of potentially setting up kiosks or, or, or various other areas to get in, to get engagement. And so we're still here tonight um, with that question before the council is in order to sort of be the most prudent um, and protect the city financially, um, does the city council want to sort of do this analysis in 2020 or 2022? Um, and really, it's not a decision to have district elections. I think one of the public comments said that, that we shouldn't be here talking about forcing district elections upon the city. That's not at all what is proposed. What is uh, talked about is, does the city council want to launch a public engagement process that is at minimum five meetings to start to have that conversation with the community? And then at the end of the day, the decision is always the city council's, whether you go to district elections or not, sort of legal risks aside. So, so then will, will there be any point where we hear about anything other than district elections? Absolutely. I think what we heard last time uh, from a, um, um, from yourself uh, and I think some other council members is the desire to look into alternative um, election methods, being that proportion, proportional election or districts 
uh, with another election methodology. Uh, and I, um, what was said then, and I think uh, Mark mentioned in his presentation, is that uh, whenever the city council decides to launch the public engagement, we can look at alternative uh, methods. Um, those that are district election, those that are district election plus something else, and those that may not be district election um, at all, um, and run that analysis on if it provides a safe harbor um, and what the risks are of that. Uh, but absolutely, I mean, what's before you is uh, when do you launch that sort of analysis and public engagement? Okay, and then, um and so, and then just a follow up with um, Doug. So, I want, I just want to make sure I'm really crystal clear on this $30,000 um, because, again, the safe harbor section in your presentation um, does give an entire um, process prior to any funds being given to an attorney. It, it seems like a lawsuit can't begin for, like I said, about 135 days. So of the cities that you've worked with, how, how many have actually had to pay $30,000, maybe percentage-wise? Well, uh, since the $30,000 and the 135 day provisions are written in law, it, it's true that any jurisdiction that gets a letter, unless they prevail in court, and no one has yet, they'll have to pay at least the $30,000 letter. Some have not, simply because some of these lawyers send out so many letters that they lost track of who they'd send le letters to, and they have a certain window where they have to demand payment. So there's a handful of cities that the lawyer was just late asking for money so they didn't have to pay. Right. And, uh, and but sorry, outside I mean, of that mistake, um, all of them that got letters had to pay either you know, up to the $32,000 that the lawyer demanded or had to pay litigation fees in the six and seven figures. And that, that was prior to the 135 days? Yes, yes. At the end of 135 days, you, the plaintiff's attorney can file a lawsuit, in which case you're instantly in the six figures at least. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted clarification on. Thank you. Sure. Other questions or comments from counsel? Through the chair. Laura. I'll make this brief because we've, we've, we've kind of been going around and around a lot here and a lot of questions, which are good questions, but um, I just simply have four statements. Number one, we didn't plan or did we budget $45,000 for this, um, and we already have a tight budget. Um, number two, there's a lot more pressing issues, I think, in the city that we should be focusing on this year. Um, and number three, thankful for, I guess, governor's order that there has been a reduced risk, and so thank you for that, Mark, as well. And number four, I think, um, let's see what happens with the other lawsuits. You know, there are some pending litigations, and who knows if um, things change and that at 2022 we'll be looking at a different, different situation and, and we have more options. Um, I think we represent the city very well. I don't think that going through a process to try to push this through this year is going to make any sense. Um, but I do hear the concern from the city clerk, the city attorney, and the city manager. In the presentation a couple weeks ago, 43% of the communities are already gone to districting. We know that five already, and a sixth one, including Burlingame, will probably head that direction. It is coming, something needs to change, but I think we can wait until 2022. To the chair. Marty. So I agree. Um, it's the law. The timing is not best, but to try 2020. Um, for various reasons with the census coming out, with the COVID-19 going on and trying to get a rush product out. Um, I, I believe with the additional protection, it, it's not a, and maybe the city attorney or our consultant could answer, it's not, the, the governor's order isn't a guarantee that we're not gonna get in a little bit of trouble, but um, nonetheless, in 2022, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to figure this out. And prior to that, we could also look at district elections and, and look at a rotating mayor. And we could talk about those that are priority setting meetings. Um, so I'm in favor of moving forward uh, for 2022 um, districting. Any other comments, Vice Mayor? Anything? OK, 
Okay, so what I'm getting is, uh, it seems like, um, I'm not quite sure, Michael, but that uh, 2020 seems that nobody wishes to proceed with the current environment that we're in, the economic element, uh, and et cetera, on, on a community outreach, but that it would be 2022. I think that's the first thing that I'm, I'm grasping from my colleagues. Um, whether they wish to even look at it or not, but at least if that, if it were to go forward, it'd be 2022. But then the other thing too, it's about the re, uh, retaining um, uh, NDC. And to me, if if we, in my opinion, if we are going to be going forward uh, and saying as a team we're going to look at this at 222, go ahead and do the outreach. In my world, obviously we're not moving forward, but I would not even uh, commit in my mind, commit to this time, to this particular, uh, Mr. Johnson, it's no disrespect, but I think we have opportunity and time to look further and just to look at a more broader base uh, and then make that decision when the time comes uh, appropriately. Any other thoughts or comments? Through the chair. Laura. Um, on that comment, I think the circumstance was who can do it and get it done this year, and so that limited the opp opportunities for those companies. So. I think when you're not pressured with that, then there might be other companies out there at different costs. I'm not sure. Um, I did actually spend some time and look on the website and reach out some information, and, and I, I find them to be very reputable. I find the presentation that we had two weeks ago to be very reputable. Um, I feel that they're very knowledgeable, so it's not to say that they're not the right company, but I don't think that we need to decide that right now either. No, and in no way am I saying that. It's just those were our two questions, 2022, 2020, and retain. So I just want to make sure that we are moving down a direction that we have consensus or not consensus on. So if I may, Mr. Mayor yes. would recommend a, a motion uh, if, there, if there is a majority to go to 2022 elections so that district elections, so that will be clear in the record and we'll, we'll have that in the minutes. Understood. To, to the chair. Uh, Laura. I'd like to motion that we um, do we move to 2022 for district elections or discussion decision? Second. Motion made and second to go ahead and look toward 2022 if we were going to go to district elections after going to community outreach and public input, et cetera, and then making a decision at that time. Is that, did I summarize that okay? Yes. Okay. Marty, is that okay on your second? Yes. Okay. Motion uh, has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? I I'm sorry, we, I think we need to, what was Roll there, call. did all five members vote? Did, I voted no. aye. Was there any no's? No. There's, so there's one no, all correct? Right. And for the so, record, so four, yes. one. Council Member Mason, thank you very much. Just, just, it was hard to hear. Um, thank you for clarifying. So we have a four, one, uh, Mason, no. Okay, anything else on that topic? No. Javon, anything else, Mark? Okay, let's move on to comments from council members. Anyone have comments this evening? To the chair. Michael. So um, I wanted to comment on the fact that this was our first live streaming meeting. Um, it, it's something I asked for years ago, and it was really never a huge priority. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate that it took a global pandemic to kind of force that. But uh, I did want to commend staff for making the effort and making that possible so that now we have another medium going forward to um, get our, our message out to the public and hopefully encourage more participation. I checked in and saw about 26 uh, people logged in, so that's 26 more than we would have had otherwise. So uh, thank you, staff, for that. I also wanted to um, sort of suggest that we also look at um, something that a lot of the other jurisdictions are doing with uh, other uh, live meetings so that we we could hold more um, more meetings as was re uh, suggested by one of the speakers where you know we could get back to more of a business as usual mode if we were to allow some of our uh, committees and commissions to do um, zoom meetings and not to push one uh, uh, provider over others, but uh, Zoom seems to be a popular one uh, with the county and with some of the other jurisdictions uh, within the county. And it does allow people to stay at home and observe the shelter in place uh, requirement and still conduct business and they can be open to the public and actually uh, allow the public to engage directly. So I just wanted to put that out there. 
Um, also, uh, on today's um, um, county supervisors meeting, uh, uh, Supervisor Pine recommended that um, because of the situation that they um, change their meeting schedule and meet more often, and so they agreed that they would meet um, also uh, next Tuesday and um, move it to a weekly basis rather than a bi-weekly basis. And I thought that, um, not that we would have a whole lot of more information um, to cover, but if we were to able, if we were able to do a remote uh, type meeting and have um, a few things um, predetermined on the schedule, uh, for example, just more uh, updates on what's happening in our ELC and uh, what, uh, what what new developments are happening with uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, and we could cover those. Um, uh, a little a little more frequently and uh, also since um, council member Mason had asked for more regular updates on our um, on our finances related to this that would also be an opportunity to give a, a weekly check-in um, at least weekly or maybe even uh, more often if possible so I just wanted to put that out there as a recommendation a suggestion and see if that's something we might be able to do thank you thank you other comments from members to the chair Laura I think, uh, Jovan, one of your first comments when you came uh, to San Bruno was you looked around this facility and you said, this is the equipment, this is the setup. And I, I know if you could wave your magic wand that you'd want to spend the money that it takes to get us to the state of the art. Um, and that includes streaming and a good quality. And so I know that's a priority, that's just the money's not there. And so I appreciate what it took to get this tonight, and I know that that's not easy. And so thank you to staff, and thank you for everybody involved in getting us some sort of quality of a st online, uh, online streaming, so kudos. Um, and the other comment I just want to make is I actually completed my census. Um, and I went online, and it was very short and sweet, and um, I've offered to help my mom and anybody else who needs help. So I think we as residents could reach out they're starting to communicate and panic about it, the seniors. I'm required to do this. I need to do this. you got to help me. So I think we can all reach out to the seniors um, that are out there that are getting this in the mail. They don't really know how to do it, um, and they're, they, they, need, they need a helping hand. So, Other members? Through the chair. Marty. Yes. Um, having uh, streaming meetings is great. Um, there are, are a few silver uh, linings in these clouds that we're facing with right now, and that's one of them, being able to have these meetings, um, identifying those students that don't have access and hopefully getting them access. The non-ending support and of volunteers in San Bruno and having the San Bruno Community Foundation put together a website to make those connections. Um, and um, I just want to thank everybody. Um, we, we have to shut down and minimize contacts to stop spreading uh, COVID-19. Very, very simple. In the conference call with the, in the county today, there's too many people that are going out and disregarding what everybody else is telling them. And the sooner we all comply, the sooner we will be off of these restrictions. Um, so um, my last comment um, announcement is there is a um, second harvest grocery distribution occurring Thursday at Bel Air. However, we have to keep in mind to protect the community and protect the volunteers that we're turning that into a, a drive through pickup event. Um, you can still call Second Harvest to register and find ways that we can get food delivered to you. They're at 1-800-984-3663. You can call them from the hours of 8 to 5 p.m. Um, so, uh, Look out for each other and be safe. Thank you. Linda? Yep. Okay. Um.
um, just a, a couple of things. One is just uh, um, I'm echoing all the council members. It's really exciting to have a live stream meeting. So thank you to our city manager for getting this together. And thank you for San Bruno Cable. Um, while everybody's at home, we have counting right now three San Bruno Cable members. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, probably about eight to 10 staff members here um, practicing social distance. But while everybody's at home, they're here um, to ensure that our meetings are, are moving forward and that the public is informed on what's going on. So thank you to staff and to San Bruno Cable and thank you for live streaming. Um, I wanted to also thank all the grocers. I know that there have been announcements going around, but just a reminder for everybody watching that in San Bruno, Lecky's has special hours now on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 6 to 9 a.m. Uh, Lenardi's on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 7 to 8 a.m. And Molly Stone's Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 7 to 8 a.m. And those are for seniors and the immunocompromised. Um, I wanted to also just a, a reminder and to reiterate the message on Friday and the consistent message from the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, which is please do not hoard. Please just buy what you need. We have not had a population boom here in San Bruno. If you buy what you need, you should not have to buy you know, a million rolls of toilet paper, which is why we don't have toilet paper when you go to the store. So please just get what you need. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to um, encourage everybody to read the San Mateo County Health Officer's um, recent statement that came out yesterday in regards to COVID-19. Um, it is, uh, it makes what's happening right now in San Mateo County and the rest of the United States and the world actually just feel incredibly real. Um, and I wanted in, um, in honor of, I guess, today's takeout, uh, takeout night, read just the last paragraph. And what he says is, as for the demand shock, look around and determine which small business you'd like to see still in your community when this is all over. Then patronize them. Even if they are not open and you can't get goods and services from them, you may want to consider paying them for services you might have received from them or they will be gone. So with that said, I wanna really encourage everybody to support our local businesses. I wanna thank um, Saida Stroud. I wanna thank um, Chamber Ambassador Karen Cunningham. She personally called every restaurant on San Mateo Avenue, on San Bruno Avenue, Mills Park Plaza, while Ashley McCown actually went to each business personally in Bay Hill Town Center and El Camino Real to create that directory that Javon showed earlier. Uh, it's now available on Facebook and I believe it's gonna be available on the Chamber site. So please, if you're watching, please, please, please uh, make sure to go and patronize our local businesses. Thank you. And for me, uh, I'll echo a lot of my colleagues in. Yes, on the streaming, but it's these folks that are behind the camera on the other side. Thank you for all your uh, effort from Friday through today to make sure that this actually happened and occurred. Thank you. Also, um, you know, I think that we, we have to heed what is being said. You can watch the news about the surge. You can watch the news about, um, you know, trying to stay and only go out for essentials, but it's about the safe distance. And this Saturday, I did have to go to town center to pick up some stuff. I did not hoard, but it was just some simple items, and it was good to see that there was stuff on the shelves. But what I did witness was uh, a gentleman and a lady, and, and they weren't the millennials, but uh, hugging in front of the store, embracing. And it's like, what aren't we getting? In, in a line, you know, you try to keep that distance. So I'm moving forward, the person's moving up behind me. And by the third time, then it kind of rang the bell, like, oh, that's right, safe distance. So I think it is really critical and something that we learned from some of our colleagues in other communities that folks are taking a travel over to Half Moon Bay or Pacifica to where you have a Pacifica person who works for San Bruno, who her and her husband went there over the weekend just to take a walk and turned to, uh, drove away. It was too crowded. The Half Moon Bay mayor has told us that, you know, he went and tried to enjoy his beach and uh, it was so packed with folks. So the thing is, if we don't take it serious, um, we could find ourselves having more strict standards placed upon us until we get over this. I think it also was enlightening to me to talk to Nadia, our Parks and Rec Commissioner, uh, who goes to Cappuccino, talking to another person who represents the San Mateo Union High School District and is the youth rep on that body uh, that represents Kenyatta, Skyline, um, and uh, CSM. And to hear their perspective from their youth uh, is that some, I'm not saying them, some feel that the youth is, I'm okay, I'm healthy, my friends are healthy. 
it'll be like the flu. Maybe it's an overreaction to the social media that they're seeing that are of their friends and them being together and enjoying each other's company. And I think we have to take very serious. It's not about that you won't get over it or that you can't. It's about what you will do to others. It's about you being a carrier. It's about you bringing it at home to your parents, to your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents, or to others that you may see that you don't even know. And so I think we have to heed very clearly, and I think this council is resolute, that we need to take it serious. We need to look out for each other. We need to support our community. We need to support our businesses. But we also need to stay safe, and that will save lives. So I hope we all heed that as we continue on this week. So with that, I thank you all for joining us, and we will go ahead and adjourn to the next regular city council meeting, which will be held on April the 14th, right here at the San Bruno Senior Center at 7 o'clock. Meeting adjourned.